Cambridge, England, 2009. World-renowned physicist Stephen Hawking threw a party. Canapes were prepared, champagne poured. But friends and family weren't on the guest list. The only people invited were time travelers. Here's somebody who worked on the physics of black holes, worked on the physics of time. And he thought to himself, if time travelers exist, they might all come together at one specific point in space and time for a party. The invites gave a place, date, and time, but they weren't sent out until after the party happened. But he only invited people from the future who could travel back into the past. Professor Hawking waited and waited and waited. Unfortunately, no one showed up. Is this proof that time travel doesn't exist? Well, no, maybe, maybe he's just known in the future as having thrown really crappy parties. A party without guests isn't much of a party. Could time travelers jump back in time and liven things up? We're all moving into the future. That is, in essence, time travel. You're traveling into the future at 60 seconds per minute. It's kind of a cop-out, though. When you talk about time travel, you want to talk about leapfrogging into the future or going into the past. If we want to go to Stephen Hawking's party, which is now in the past, how do we do that? One way would be to change our passage through time. According to Albert Einstein, that's possible. A hundred years ago, Einstein started a scientific revolution which requires us to let go of our common sense ideas about what space and time are. So instead of thinking of our universe as a three-dimensional place that just changes over time, we should think of reality as this four-dimensional place called space-time. If you stop and think about it, all of your observations of time are directly coupled to watching something move in space, right? What is a day, really, but the rising and the setting of the sun? Or an hour, but the motion of a hand on a clock? The three dimensions of space are linked with one dimension of time, making a four-dimensional space-time continuum. For wannabe time travelers, that's good news. It means motion through space is connected to motion through time. We move through space-time, not space or time. And the way this works is that if I'm standing still and I'm not moving through space very quickly, then I move through time as fast as is possible. This DeLorean doesn't look like it's moving, but it is. It's moving through time. The car, its driver, and the road it's parked on are all moving through time at the same rate second by second. But when the driver hits the gas, some of that movement through time is converted into movement through space. As soon as I have motion through space, some of my intrinsic movement through space-time is now taken up by that motion. As I move faster through space, I move slower through time. Scientists call this time dilation. It turns fast-moving humans into time travelers. March 27, 2015. Astronaut Scott Kelly traveled to the International Space Station. His year-long mission was to study the effects of space flight on the human body. Scott was the perfect candidate because back on Earth, he had an identical twin, Mark. They did this for a variety of reasons to explore the effects of space travel and weightlessness on the human body using as controlled an experiment as possible. 
Lack of gravity wasn't the only difference between the twins. Scott was orbiting Earth at 17,000 miles an hour. So compared to his Earth-bound twin, Scott moved forwards through time. This time travel into the future isn't just an abstract physics concept. Scott, the orbiting twin, literally jumped into the future by a fraction of a second. When Scott finally returned back to Earth, because of his rapid speed, he aged just a little bit slower than his brother, and he was actually younger by a tiny fraction of a second. 17,000 miles an hour is fast, but to jump more than a fraction of a second into the future, Scott needed to go way faster. What if Scott Kelly had wanted to let the Earth age a thousand years while he was in orbit for one year? How fast would he have had to orbit the Earth to do that? And it turns out he'd have to orbit at almost the speed of light. To put it in perspective, just how fast that is, the fastest human piloted vehicle in history was Apollo 10 that went at 25,000 miles per hour. You would need to go more than 25,000 times faster than that. That's pretty fast. In the future, we might try to build a spaceship with advanced propulsion capable of light speed. But the laws of physics won't make it easy. It would take an infinite amount of energy to accelerate something, a car, a marble, a galaxy, whatever, to the speed of light. And so for that reason, we think that the speed of light is itself a truly unbreakable speed. If you want to take a human-sized spacecraft and accelerate it to 10% of the speed of light, let alone 90% or 99% of the speed of light, it requires more energy than humanity has ever used in its entire existence and probably will ever use in its entire existence. Jumping forward in time isn't simple, but the physics of the universe make it possible. Going close to the speed of light slingshots you into the future faster, but it does not take you to the past in any way. It's not a way to go backwards in time and visit anyone's party. A super fast, time-traveling spaceship can't take us back to Hawking's party. But what about a time machine that exists out in the cosmos? <laughs> 